Quantum physics is all about fundamental particles and how they interact. But if I were to ask you, what do all these things have in common? What would you say? What is the common denominator? I would say it's energy. All particles and interactions are about confining or exchanging or doing something with energy. Even mass is a form of energy. But energy by itself can't give you the whole picture of reality. We need one more ingredient. We need to have a description of the energy states of matter. We call this information. So essentially, energy and information make up our reality. In fact, information theory posits that every aspect of a particle can be expressed as information and put into a binary code. But information is also related to entropy. In this video, we're going to explore the link between information and entropy by examining what I think is one of the most fascinating thought experiments in physics, which seems to show that entropy can be reversed. And in answering the question of whether it really can, a brilliant German physicist discovered a surprising insight about information, which has huge implications for the computers we use today and sets a limit to how powerful we can make computers of the future. Stay tuned because that fascinating story is coming up right now. To examine the role of information in reality, I need to tell you a little bit about the second law of thermodynamics. The simplest definition of it is that in a closed system, the total entropy always increases or remains constant in any spontaneous process. It never decreases. But to understand what this means, we have to understand what entropy is. The common way that people tend to think of entropy is a measure of disorder of a system. But that definition is subjective and can be a little bit of an oversimplification. A better way to think of entropy is in terms of the amount of information needed to describe a system. This concept may not be what you were taught in high school, so let me elaborate what I mean by this. In the 19th century, Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann was able to bridge the gap between the macroscopic laws of thermodynamics and the microscopic behavior of atoms and molecules. He hypothesized that the entropy of a system is related to the number of ways that the system's particles can be arranged. In other words, the more ways that the particles of a system can be arranged, the higher the entropy of the system. He quantified this mathematically with his famous equation, where S is entropy, K is the Boltzmann's constant, and LNW represents the natural log of the number of microstates corresponding to a system's overall macrostate. The number of microstates is also related to the amount of information necessary to describe the system. The more information that's necessary, the higher the entropy. This can also reflect the degree of disorder or randomness in a system. A system with high entropy has many possible arrangements and thus describing its exact state requires more information. Scottish scientist James Clerk Maxwell questioned the absolute nature of the second law of thermodynamics, recognizing its statistical rather than deterministic foundation. Maxwell posited that the second law was not unbreakable, but merely a tendency of nature, a probability guiding the universe. He regarded entropy as a statistical phenomenon, not strictly required to always increase, but rather overwhelmingly likely to do so. The chances of entropy decreasing in any large isolated system are so vanishingly small, he thought, that such an event would never occur within any practical time frame inside a finite universe. In 1867, Maxwell devised a thought experiment to test just how fundamental the second law of thermodynamics truly is. He imagined a box divided into two halves by a sealed wall with a tiny door just large enough for a single molecule to pass through. The gas inside the box is initially at a uniform temperature, so even if the door were open, the overall temperature would remain unchanged. The two halves are in thermal equilibrium. And if the box is completely isolated from its surroundings, this represents a state of maximum entropy of the gas. Maxwell proposed a tiny, intelligent entity, better known by the creative name of Maxwell's demon, which was able to sort fast-moving and slow-moving gas molecules through an imaginary frictionless door without expending any energy. He would open the door such that all the fast-moving molecules get arranged on one side of the box, and all the slow-moving molecules 
would be on the other side of the box. The velocity of the gas particles directly corresponds to the average temperature of the chambers. The result of the demon's efforts creates a separation of hot particles from the cold particles. After the demon's work is done, one side of the chamber is hotter and the other is colder. Overall energy has not changed, but the thermal equilibrium has been disrupted and the entropy of the system has decreased. You might ask, why has it decreased? Let's look at it in terms of the Boltzmann's equation. Initially, since the average kinetic energy of the atoms, which corresponds to the average temperature, is evenly distributed, there are a greater number of ways to distribute the atom's energies and positions across the full volume of the chamber. But when the atoms with the same overall energy are confined into two smaller volumes at different temperatures, this limits the different combinations of speeds and positions that the atoms can take, resulting in a lower number of microstates, or lower value of W in the equation, meaning lower entropy. In fact, Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard proposed that one could harness this temperature difference to run a heat engine, creating work. Yet all of this seems to have occurred within the closed system without any apparent exchange of entropy or energy with its external environment. This outcome appears to contradict the second law of thermodynamics because entropy seems to have decreased. Could this be correct? The answer turns out to be no, but for a surprising reason. In order for this to work, the demon has to have an intelligence. He or she has to process information in order to sort the atoms. He has to figure out which atoms to let in and out through the door. He can't merely open and close the door randomly. So there's an unavoidable step in the process where entropy must increase. Strangely, the increase does not occur during the measurement of particle trajectories or the movement of the door, but rather in the storage of information and the memory of the demon. For the demon to perform this task, it must acquire knowledge about the particles. This means that the demon or the particle sorting system it ultimately represents must begin in a known and predictable state. As it interacts with each particle, this state is affected and it accumulates information. From our perspective, the randomness of the particles decreases as they're sorted, but this randomness is not eliminated. It is merely transferred into the demon's memory, being stored there. The information processing in its brain creates more information within the system, and thus increasing entropy. There's a second surprising twist in this model of entropy. In 1961, physicist Rolf Landauer showed the exact step where the apparent violation of the second law of thermodynamics by Maxwell's demon could be explained. He showed that the demon must erase information about the molecules it sorts. Since the demon's brain or memory is finite and therefore limited, it cannot store an infinite amount of information. Landauer showed that it was not the process of creating information, but erasing it, which has an associated cost in terms of energy. In other words, erasing information creates heat. And it's this heat that enters the system or leaves into the universe and therefore accounts for the missing entropy which ensures that the second law of thermodynamics is not violated. The energy cost of erasing information is given by Landauer's principle, which states that the minimum energy needed to erase one bit of information is proportional to the absolute temperature at which the system operates times the Boltzmann's constant and natural log of two. At room temperature of 300 Kelvin, this number turns out to be about three times 10 to the negative 21 joules or 0.018 electron volts. And Landauer's principle, as you might imagine, not only applies to Maxwell's demon, but to all computational processes, including modern computers. Every time a bit is erased in a digital system, energy dissipates into heat. This principle was experimentally proven in 2012. So the mischievous little demons can't build heat engines that violate the second law at least not without paying a thermodynamic price. Despite the fact that the second law was not violated, James Clark Maxwell was not wrong in questioning the very foundation of thermodynamics. 
Rather, his thought experiment was an intellectual challenge to explore the fundamental principles of entropy and statistical mechanics. Maxwell's ideas were later refined by physicists like Ludwig Boltzmann and Josiah Willard Gibbs. They showed that in microscopic systems, thermal fluctuations could indeed momentarily decrease entropy. Boltzmann's statistical mechanics described how entropy is not a fixed quantity, but instead reflects the most probable state of a system. Small fluctuations could lead to temporary decreases in entropy, but over time, the overall system still follows the second law. What does this all mean for modern computers? It means every time a bit is erased in a digital system, an unavoidable energy cost has to be paid. And this leads to a significant challenge in computing. For decades, Moore's law has driven the exponential growth of computing power, with transistors shrinking and processors becoming faster and more powerful. But yet they remain highly inefficient because of the fundamental physical limits. And what do you think is at the heart of this inefficiency? It's Landauer's principle. It sets a theoretical minimum amount of energy required to erase a single bit of information on which even a perfectly efficient computer has to run. But as we miniaturize components and increase their processing capability, we hit a thermodynamic wall due to entropy in the form of heat. This is known as the Landauer limit. Today, we're nowhere near this limit. So even our most efficient computers are many orders of magnitude less efficient than the most perfectly efficient computer. But what if we could build a computer that returns all information and recycles energy? Landauer proved that energy loss results from information destruction, not the computation itself. In fact, Landauer's principle is often framed as a lower bound for the energy cost of reversible computation, meaning that it applies to irreversible processes where information is lost. But Landauer was well aware that for reversible processes, there is no fundamental energy dissipation requirement. By using reversible computing, we can decouple heat generation from information processing, significantly reducing energy consumptions. In fact, startups like Viera Computing based in London are working on their first reversible computing chip prototypes with full-scale production expected in 2027. Quantum computers could also create reversible computing in theory. In quantum mechanics, the evolution of a quantum system is reversible and governed by unitary transformations, which means that quantum computers theoretically operate in a reversible manner. However, when you make a measurement in quantum computing, you collapse the wave function which is an irreversible process, but it might still benefit from reversible computation principles in the future. Though practical quantum computers are not yet at a stage where they can exploit this directly for energy efficiency. So if at the quantum level, processes turn out to be reversible in nature, what does that mean for the universe as a whole? Is the universe itself reversible? We'll explore that question in our next video. So stay tuned for that. If you like this video, then give us a thumbs up and subscribe so that you can be informed when we post that follow-up video. I'll see you in the next video, my friends.